The views and opinions expressed by the hosts of Black Talk Radio News and any guests represents their views and their views only and do not necessarily represent the views of the Black Talk Media Project or the Black Talk Radio Hello Network. and welcome to this episode of Black Talk Radio News. My name is Scotty Reed. I'm broadcasting from behind the enemy lines that I call USA Inc. In this episode, I will be speaking with John Jeter. He is a former Washington Post bureau chief for Southern Africa. He's an author, columnist, and an independent journalist creating content on the Patreon platform and at johnjeter.com. I asked John to join me for a discussion on the collapse of the Black News Channel and if it matters as much as some people think in terms of the African diaspora, particularly African Americans, controlling their own stories without oversight from the corporate system. We spoke about the collapse of this outlet that targeted African Americans but was not necessarily giving an authentic grassroots African American perspective. All right, John, so it's good to speak to you after speaking to you just a few days ago. And Always, to, brother. Yeah, I want to thank you for taking the time out to uh, join us from outside of the enemy lines of U.S. <laughs> uh, to discuss some news that I think is particular um, of interest to our audience here on Black Talk Radio Network. So, you know, but also I wanted to thank you for the work uh, that you do because I don't think I had to convince you or my audience um, that, you know, there's a a serious lack of authentic, objective uh, news sources for African Americans or Africans in the diaspora uh, that they can trust. You know, it seems like everything is filtered through the corporate media, and some will argue thereby, you know, filtered through the U.S. government, whoever's, you know, the dominant, whoever's, the dominant party at the time. And then, of course, even those who are so-called out of power have their own um, news channels that they're closely affiliated with and work to put out propaganda. So, you know, I don't think I had to convince you of that. Um, But speaking of independence news outlets, um, we are getting reports, and I'm speaking to you from or reading from a Guardian article um, but the Black News Channel is shutting down after just a little over uh, two years in existence, it, or, or actually one year. Uh, it right. launched in, in 2019, and so, um, you know, we are here in 2022, so it's probably just a little over a year, but that's never here or there. It's still shutting down in a right. short order of time. So what was your initial reaction when you heard that news? Uh, I was surprised it took this long. Uh, the the Black News Channel was destined to fail uh, simply for the fact that it's not for us, by us, or of us. And by us, of course, I mean black people, right? It purports to uh, serve the interests, the, 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 the information needs of black people. It did nothing of the sort. It mimicked uh, the mediocrity of the mainstream, corporate, white majority news, uh, news media. And uh, as such, it was inauthentic, it was unnecessary, it was unhelpful to black struggle, to uh, uh, black understanding of our issues. It did not bring uh, a a black cultural perspective to the news. It brought the same white cultural perspective uh, to the news that you can get from MSNBC, CNN, uh, uh, or any other uh, mainstream major a legacy outlet. So why do we need uh, the Black News Channel to mimic uh, what we can easily get uh, all across the airwaves and all throughout our our, uh, our newspapers? So yeah, it's uh, it's not surprising to me at all. It was really awful. I would watch it from time to time just to sort of for amusement, I guess, and to sort of see just how bad it was. But it doesn't surprise me at all. I've been expecting it for some time. Now, the station was co-founded by television executive Bob Berlante, who is a um, non-African-European-looking fella, and former Congressman J.C. Watts. Now, J.C. Watts had been out of politics for a long time, but correct me if I'm wrong, he was uh, elected from uh, Oklahoma to the House of Representatives, U.S. uh, Congress House of Representatives as a Republican. And uh, he he was also is inaugural uh, chairman. So when 
it was first announced that it, you know, that this channel was was going to launch. I was skeptical from jump just because of the ownership. Right, right. Did you have yeah, similar yeah. concerns? Oh yeah, I mean, it's you know, look, man, um, uh, journalism just like uh, grassroots movements or just like move, social movements, it has to come from the grassroots, it has to come from the bottom up, right? Uh, and uh, 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 if you have a news outlet that's owned by, I believe the owner is Southeast Asian, he's a staunch Republican, a supporter of Donald Trump, that's, that's never going to work, right? We, we uh, you know, as James Baldwin said, black people, we have a different way of understanding the world, we have a different vision of life, and there's no way in the world you could get, uh, uh, you know, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, and sure, NFL team, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the the owner of a of an NFL franchise, the uh, the most egregiously racist of all the uh, major sports uh, platforms, the NFL. There's no way in the world you're going to have that man uh, 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 invest in a vehicle that actually promoted black liberation, right? It just it, mm. it wasn't going to happen. So this was um, this was an ex an experiment in failure. That's all it was, right? It, it, it teaches very wealthy investors, you know, how not to fail again, which, you know, I guess we're all better served by that. Right. And can you touch upon, earlier you made the reference that media, you know, uh, should be like from the bottom up, um, right. the grassroots up, and not, you know, top down, like exactly. most of uh, your corporate media, well, all of it basically, with, which is the way it's structured. But it seems to me in that vein, it seems to me my observation has been that whether we're talking about Fox News, which is targeted towards conservative uh, so-called Americans, and then you mentioned MSNBC, um, which targets the quote-unquote left, and I do put the left in air quotes, cause right, it's, right, but, it, right. but it seems like they are both um, vehicles for either the RNC or the DNC. With Fox News, though, having a little trouble, you know, with Trumpism in the, you know, there seems to be a divide between the more refined races of the Republican Party versus a more crude and objectionable races like Donald Trump. But in, in terms of MSNBC, my observation is, you know, it's strictly uh, pushing the DNC agenda. And so right. it, it's just sad that we're talking about new, quote unquote, news channels. And when you look at the definition of news, you think, and journalism, you think of a objective, unbiased party. Um, who's just simply trying to ascertain the facts, uh, facilitate conversations around those facts. But again, I, I surmise that they're just pushing uh, party politics on the masses. No, that's that's exactly what it is. And you know, Scotty, I'm, I'm uh, you know, you you come at this with a different world experience than I do. You know, as a veteran uh, and and someone who's really representing your community, and so. What you're doing is really representative of citizens' journalism, which I believe is the future, right? Like if we're going to be freed from this catastrophe, from this, from this debacle, right, it's going to be because of people like you from the ground up, citizens' journalism, community journalism. That's what's going to really free us. But I, I'm trained as a journalist. I went to school at Florida A&M University as a journalist, you know, in the 1980s. And what I can tell you is this. Uh, the only way that we can counter the lies of the mainstream media is through storytelling, telling our story, the story of who we are, right, our ideas. And I don't mean, you know, and so if you watch the Black News Channel, if you ever watched it, it, it didn't, they didn't report. There was no reporting. There was no going out in the street, talking to a man in the street, black man in the street, black woman in the street. What are your concerns? What are your issues? What do you think is the solution to this problem? There was none of that. It was you should do this. Black people should do this. I'm writing a piece now for my Patreon page, and I want to talk about just uh, um, one segment that I saw was back in August of 2021 where one of their anchors, Mark Lamont Hill, who's also a scholar, interviewed a Duke University scholar, um, uh, Mark Anthony Neal, and they were basically lecturing blacks on their homophobia. Now, I'm not 
convinced that blacks are particularly homophobic, right? I, I think that it, uh, if it is an issue, it's uh, relatively a small one, and certainly it's not one that's attended by violence, as we see in the white community. But beyond that, uh, the job of a journalist is not to lecture the people. It's to inform the people. It's to basically reflect what's going on in our community, what's going on in our heads, and get it back to us so we can start a conversation. But yet you have these two black men, black scholars, so-called, lecturing mm -hmm. us on how we should stop being homophobic. Well, I'm not sure that we are, but, but more than that, maybe you should listen to the people instead of telling the people what to do. Right. You know, in, um, on that particular topic of whether or not black folks are homophobic, but more importantly, facilitating conversations perhaps that you never saw on the Black News Channel or any of the other channels, but um, we had interviewed a mother uh, her name is, uh, she's from the Atlanta area. Uh, first name is Kim, her last name, Kim Melanson. Yeah, that, that was her name. And so her son uh, was convicted of murdering a uh, trans, uh, what would they call him, a trans woman, where it's a male transitioning to a female. And so he he was I guess they call it catfishing you know I'm we're both oh, right. in our 50s so right, I may not right, be up with right. the, with the I think I know what you mean. Right. <laughs> but you know pretended to be a biological I call them uh, what is it uh, double X females uh, right. double X chromosome female uh, represented themselves on an online dating site. Um, fraudulently and not, you know, revealing, I feel like was important details for anyone who's contemplating getting into an intimate relationship with someone else should be apprised of, of those. Otherwise, you're taking away their choice. And so um, this young man, young black brother who was in the Navy at the time, going to, who was a, a, in the field of meteorology, um, and so he, he stationed um, somewhere, I guess, in the Gulf of Mexico or something, somewhere close to there that he was stationed. So he meets this person online. They go to a motel. They have sex. And from what I could gather, that he was very inexperienced. This might have been his first time, you know, in a situation mm -hmm. like that with, with a woman. And, um, and then he said, this is what he said in court, is that, you know, through the court filings, is that after however it was they had sex, the uh, person, uh, D, I forget the last name, the person just all of a sudden said, and by the way, I'm a man. Oh, I was wow. born a man. By the way, I was born a man. That, that's what the person said. And this person flipped out. This person mm -hmm. flipped out. I would argue if I was his attorney, temporary insanity, um, because I had been in it, and then I was sharing like my personal connection, facilitating a conversation around it, and not justifying the the, uh, the killing, but saying relaying a personal experience I had as a 17 or 18 year old under the influence of alcohol in a juke joint. You know, uh, yeah. back in the day we call them hole in the walls where they right. sell illegal liquor after dark. Right. And I meet this female, and we end up in the back seat of a car, and we know what we get in the back seats to do. And then I'm looking at her face, and I notice this this black band across the corner of her forehead, and I'm figuring that's a wig. Then I look down, and I see a, something I've never seen before, which was a C-section scar. And then I'm thinking that I'm with a, a person who has transitioned from male to female, and my first reaction was to put my hands around that person's throat. Wow. Am, I, wow. am I justifying, you know, my reaction? I don't think my reaction needs justification. It was what it was. Right, right. Wow, that's a hell of a story, Scotty. That's a hell of that, and that that man, that's so that, that's so representative of what I'm talking about and bringing our perspective, and not just our perspective, bro, but the honesty. That reminds me of the the, the famous Richard Pryor story, right, where he goes to. He's asked to talk to uh, to uh, do a monologue for this gay fundraiser. It's a famous story in L in Los Angeles. All these white men, and he's waiting backstage. You know, Richard Pryor. He was probably half lit by the time he got on the stage. But he saw the stuff backstage of the the other acts were being uh, discriminated against. You know, they were asking for help and couldn't get any help. And 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 he's so pissed off when he gets on stage about these gay whites who should be allies of black people but they're actually the enemy just like 
you know, some white conservative, white straight conservative, you know. Like J. So Edgar Hoover. Right, 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 right. He calls it again, yeah. And so he launches into this tirade against how the white community, and he, well, he starts off by talking about his own uh, homosexual experience as, I think, a teenager, a young man, with a guy who was a lifelong friend. And he talks about, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've done the same things you guys do, you know, and it's beautiful. And, you know, they're, they're, they're loving it, right? But then he launches into this tirade. But y'all are not helping black people at all. And he didn't say it like that. Y'all are not helping black people at all, right? And see, this is the kind of conversation, man, it's raw and it's uncomfortable, right? But it holds mm -hmm. people accountable, right? And you can disagree with Richard Pryor and how he did it, but it's still a conversation. And you can move forward from that conversation, right? You can if you choose to, if you want to do the dirty work, you know? And that's mm -hmm. the purpose of black journalists, right? And black mm -hmm. journalism, right? We're not, you shouldn't be comfortable after you, if you watch the, the Black News Channel or any channel, and you're still, if you're, if you're a white person, if you're a man, right, and you understand the, all of the, the ills and the injustices done by the patriarchy to women, right, if you're straight and you understand the injustice done to people, uh, uh, the LGBT community, and you watch a news report and you're still comfortable with who you are and your place in the society and, 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 and comfortable with what has been done to your neighbor, your fellow human beings, that's not journalism. That's not journalism. You should be profoundly discomfited by journalism. Right. And, and the purpose of uh, Kim for reaching out to Black Talk Radio News and to, it wasn't just to talk about the, uh, the what would I call it, uh, judicial malfeasance that went on in his case and, you know, the lack of true representation and um and all of the details of what what she felt and uh, others felt was wrong with his case but she said she wanted to facilitate a conversation between the black lgbt community and the so-called cis cisgendered you know um right, again right. i'm in my 50s so right, um, right. But, you know heterosexual <laughs> males and, and, and talking to each other so that we right. could do something to reduce this violence. So exactly. like, the purpose of me telling that story is, is that for a heterosexual male, whether you want to say that subconsciously, because I am a Christian, even though I was in the act of sin, there are just one, whether I was raised to view homosexual activity as a sin or not, it still came down to a personal choice of whether right. or not I want to to experiment, you know, uh, right. in, in that way. And so getting a uh, LGBT person who understand some of the reactions, which may be violent, um, you right. know, because in right. the mind of a very religious person, they might have feel like they committed a mortal sin or you caused them right. to commit a mortal sin, and that's their reaction. Now, again, we don't have to justify these these reactions. They are what they are. That, right. That's how the individual reacted. So that was her whole point, and she did have support of LGBTQ uh, members of the Atlanta community, and you know members in her own family who who were in, in that community. And you know the response that I got from the quote unquote white liberals was, you know, I'm homophobic and. We're talking about um, this issue in a way that's dangerous to no. We, we, I, her goal with her, um, it was called gender accountability, gender identity accountability, because they were even proposing, you know, legislation to make it a crime not to disclose, you know, before a uh, sexual act that has taken place. And and again, I do believe that the LGBT community is not a matter of belief, it's a matter of fact that these are human beings who are afforded the same human rights as anybody else. Of but course, course. Um, your, as individuals, our personal rights end where uh, another person's rights begin. And so right. if you suspect that this is a quote-unquote heterosexual male, then you should uh, respect that that your sexuality ends where that person's begins and and you know and there is the issue of uh the same way uh um males uh will look at you know betting females as a conquest i have heard from people in that community that there are some who view 
uh, uh, fooling a heterosexual male as a conquest. Uh, well, well, look, man, I, you know, this is <laughs> this is getting a little so bit these beyond. Are, these aren't the conversations that I'm seeing on corporate news media, on the MSNBC channels, as you mentioned, you know, black folks. Exactly. Well, well, but this, this is what I'm saying, though, Scott. This is exactly what I'm saying. You, you, you raised the point better than I raised it, actually, right? These are the kind of conversations. I don't have the answer. I am a 57-year-old, uh, a straight black man, straight African-American man. I don't have all the answers. But I know this. I know that the only way we can address the answer, we can find the answer, the solution to our problems, the solution to a violence against the LGBT community, the trans community, the only way we can get there is through conversation, open, honest dialogue. I don't know every, you know, I don't know all the answers. I, don't, I mean, probably we don't want to criminalize things, but still, like, we need a transparent, open conversation. This is the whole point. So one of the things I want to write about when I'm talking about the Black News Channel, for instance, is instead of lecturing uh, black people about our homophobia, why don't you do a story, and this was in August of last year when I think he had, maybe he had just been arrested or he hadn't yet been arrested, but there was a, uh, a, a very wealthy white donor in Los Angeles named Ed Buck, and right. they had pulled from his house, you probably remember this, Scotty, they had pulled like three or four dead black men because right. he was gay and they were gay. They had pulled three or four black men out of his house, out of his house, Scotty, and, and they had not charged him. Three or four. Black yeah, men let, let me explain to the audience who may not be familiar with the story. We're not talking about a Jeffrey Dahmer type situation right. where you know, all these bodies was on the premises and what have you. But no, he was a drug user and he would seek vulnerable, drug addicted uh, black men and trade drugs for sexual favors. And several of them died during the course of these interactions. That's right, that's right. And so you could have, they could have done, the Black News Channel, Mark Lamont Hill and, and, and Mark Anthony Neal, they could have done a segment investigating this. What about, this is something I don't know about, but I, I heard about in the course of this story, what about the connection between there's something about that drug lifestyle and this uh, gay lifestyle as well? You know, as, as much as there is a gay lifestyle, I'm sure that people experience very differently, but that there is a connection there, right? And I mean, I would love to know about that, not in a way to demonize people, but, you know, to understand there must be something painful about growing up gay in a, a predominantly white, male, straight society, right? And so I'm sh I would guess that people find some comfort in drugs. What about that? Instead of lecturing black people on our homophobia, and, and beyond that, beyond just the fact that the, the didactic moralizing just isn't helpful, it's not interesting, and you're not going to build an audience that way, Where's the surprise in lecturing black people on homophobia? There's, you know, I was taught in journalism school that what you, what you read a news story for, what you watch a news segment or a, or a documentary, the reason you do that is because you're waiting for the surprise, like the surprise in a Cracker Jack box, right? If you just mm -hmm. tell people something they already know, or you just sort of, you know, spreading the conventional wisdom, why should I watch you? Why do I need to listen to you? Why do I need to read that story? I spent my entire career as a journalist looking for that surprise. If there was no surprise, I didn't do the story. There's no point in doing the story if there's no surprise. So this is just, you know, we, 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 we as black people, especially the so-called town of the 10th, our best and brightest, right, like Mark Anthony, uh, Mark uh, Lamont Hill and Mark Anthony uh, uh, Neal, right, scholars, professional men with, you know, uh, masters and PhDs, we spent so much time parroting white mediocrity. We don't even know what success looks like. We don't know what the African culture which is valuable, right? That's the thing. African culture has value, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and no, maybe it, can't, maybe it can't get you tenure at Duke University, but it has value to your people and to humanity. And that's why the Black News Channel failed. It didn't recognize that, right? It's into the same formulaic uh, 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 journalism that MSNBC is into. So why, why do we need the Black News Channel? Uh, sh shifting gears for a second, um, I went over their YouTube channel because I ha did subscribe to their YouTube channel, but um, to be honest, I have my favorite news sources. They weren't really covering uh, those issues in a way that I like to see, you know, the, the host, you know, jump into. Um, but anyway, like their coverage, for example, of uh, what, what's the uh, Supreme Court nominee, Katanji? Uh, Katanji, yeah, Brown Jackson. 
Yeah, Katanji Brown Jackson. And again, their formula, it seems from the few, you know, videos that I went over of their coverage on that, that they were just simply modeling the MSNBC coverage and and focusing on the obviously blatantly and I say purposely um, racist uh, comments made by, you know, the various uh, Republican senators. But all that served to do was uh, serve as a distraction from the real important judicial issues that and questions that you should be asking a judge. So instead of the Democrats and corporate media uh, asking questions like, well, uh, Judge uh, J uh, Jackson, what are your views on qualified immunity of a police officer? Will Judge Jackson, uh, what do you think about uh, the drug laws and how it relates to, um, uh, what do they call that, uh, a seizure, you know, where, oh, right. where, where they can just take your pride. Like if they find a crack rock in your car because a crackhead was in your car, well, I shouldn't call them crackheads, but a person addicted to crack, was in the back seat of your car and they dropped the crumb and then I go through a check and they and and I um, ill advisedly give consent to a cop to search my car and they find this little crack rock and now they can take my car and seize my property or any right. cash that's that's on me. I mean these are our stories that I see, you know, in the alternative online press that I really don't see mainstream media uh, focusing on. So so what I see is it's just participating in the distraction from black news and, and, and following the same script, it seems, as the other news channels. And we're not getting these important questions answered about a woman that many of us never even heard her name before now. Yeah, and there's, and there's as, as you and I have discussed, uh, you know, there's so much more that we need to interrogate about this woman. Now, from what I know, uh, she's certainly as qualified as any of the other justices up there, more so if we're talking about this. Credentials. Uh, uh, yeah, her credentials have certainly surpassed that of this fraud, Amy Conan Baird and the, 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 the sexual, uh, uh, serial sexual assailant, uh, uh, what is, what's his name? I can't remember Rick his name. Kavanaugh. Yeah, Kavanaugh. Certainly she's more qualified than they are, right? But at the same time, I think we should interrogate. I think it would be helpful. It would be useful to the people, and black people specifically, to interrogate what is her record. Uh, you know, as, as uh, uh, Reuters did a study of 25 workplace racial discrimination cases that she handled between 2013 and 2021 and found that in 23, uh, 22 of the cases, she ruled for the employer against, yeah. I, I think they were all or almost all black plaintiffs right well what, what so what are we saying there what what shouldn't we talk about that you know what is she doing in other words she was clearly preparing for this auditioning for this job right by showing white people that she could look you know I, i'm gonna tell you the story and i know i probably said it before scotty you probably heard it before anyway but uh uh a i never i never met her but a woman named jill nelson a black woman writer who works for washington she quit before i got there and she wrote a book called Volunteer Slavery, uh, her experience at the Washington Post. And uh, she talked about how many of the black journalists in mainstream media were hired after the 1968 riots, after Martin Luther King's assassination. And they were hired by white newsrooms and realized they had no one who could go into, who could wade into southeast D.C. or uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, down, you know, in the, the, into the Detroit neighborhoods where black people were rioting, they had no reporters who could go into that chaos and talk to black people about why they were rioting. So you had all these black reporters who were hired after that, in the aftermath of that. By the same token, you have police officers, black police officers who were hired for very much the same reason. They didn't have black police officers who could go into those neighborhoods and, and urge calm, right? But mm -hmm. her point, Jill Nelson's point was... Pacification program. Yeah, basically, basically for both, right? But her point was that while black police officers were constantly uh, coerced, coaxed into proving their loyalty to the police officers, the white police officers they worked with, as opposed to the black community they came from, they were coaxed into shooting their own. Black journalists were coaxed to do the exact same thing, 
right? And mm-hmm. I think by extension, we can say that the black professional class, I don't mean that every, every black person has done this. I, I can say this, and I feel confident about saying this. You know, I worked for, uh, you know, 13 years in the Washington Post. I never did a story I'm embarrassed about. I did stories that were wrong, but never a story that, that sought to attack unfairly uh, black, black people or even a black person, right, uh, to sort of, you know, render this stereotypical portrait of black people. I never did that. But we have to sort of acknowledge that that exists within our community. That's where Barack Obama comes from. That's where Kamala Harris comes from. That's where Cory Booker comes from, right? This element within our population that seeks to shoot their own, right? And, you know, we, we have to sort of address politically that. Politically speaking. We're not, yeah, politically speaking. We're not going well, in Obama's case, actually literally speaking. But, well, yeah, that's but, true. <laughs> right. Yeah, lo- right lots, but, of, lots of black Africans dead in Libya buried somewhere. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Obama did it for real. You know, he wasn't kidding. Um, like that joke he told at the Washington Correspondents' Dinner when he's talking to the, to the Jonas Brothers, and he's talking about, you know, my, my daughter, they really like you. But uh, don't, don't get excited, boys. I have, one, I have two, two words for you. Uh, we say uh, a predator drone, right? Mm-hmm. And he says, I'm not playing, <laughs> right? He really was. They should have took him, taken him at his word, you know. But, uh, yeah, man, you know, we just, we don't, we don't have the, we don't have the conversation. We don't, and we no longer, because we haven't had these conversations in so long, we really haven't had honest conversation about mm-hmm. who we are and what we mean, what we want to be. We haven't really had these conversations since I was in college at Florida A&M in the, in the, in the mid-'80s, right, since Jesse mm-hmm. Jackson was running for president, we haven't had real, honest, open conversations. Uh, mm-hmm. They're scripted. They're performative. We perform mm-hmm. who we are in public discussions now, right? We're not who we really are. We're not who we're really meant to be. And um, that's going to end badly for all of us. You know, it's going to end badly. It's going to end worse for black people because it always does, right? But it's going to end badly for this entire country. It is. And, and let me um, just say, in case, in case the FBI or CIA is listening, I don't mean that as a threat. What I'm saying is that because we no longer have the language to actually sort of work our way through our problems, right, then, then a, 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 a uh, cataclysm is, is, is inevitable. I mean, like the Great Depression, like what happened in Nazi Germany. These yeah, things well, are well, actually, Actually, I have a news clip that I want to play, and before I play that, but it does speak to what you're saying about, about as I've been, okay, right now is the time that we really need honest and objective uh, media to cover international events and explain to African Americans and people in the African uh, diaspora what's really going on, the, geo, the, the geopolitics that's happening before us, this isn't uh, some some what I what I call uh, juvenile rivalry between Russia and USA, where you know you're on one side or you're on the other. That is more complicated than that, and there's a lot of facts that are being withheld. So if right. you don't, if you're absent the facts, how can you come to a correct uh, conclusion? Uh, right. Even it is, if it is an opinion, it would you know it's an uninformed opinion, and and so. I've been watching, making it a point to find um, foreign-based media. You know, RT got banned, got kicked off our our AT&T U-verse, and and since there's monopoly, you know, I'm ashamed to even be giving them uh, monthly fees to access their their um, their service. But it's really for other people in the house as well. But they kicked RT off. YouTube is kicked RT off. Um, they're really being suppressed. I think they're on Rumble.com, which I just set up a channel on Rumble.com. Um, and and so, you know, when I tune in to black media, now, and the fact that you're not mentioning that the U.S. is funding Nazis in the Ukraine, I'm like, what's going on? I'm right. seeing this in all the other, inter- well, I shouldn't say all the other, but I've seen from the Times of Israel, I've seen from the Greek City Time, which is a Greece-based outlet, um, not really looking at RTNT as a source, as a source because they'll easily just dismiss it as state propaganda or whatnot, but just find, find the other sources. But when you look at the news clips, because I don't watch the shows, but when I see the news clips on YouTube, 
and then knowing what I know and, and what I research and just since this since Putin first mentioned the denazification of Ukraine and for them to blatantly lie to people, I'm like, this is a very important time um right now. This is a cataclysmic event. But um not just terms of world war possible world war three, but when I listen to foreign media that I can't access, they all it, it seems like Ukraine has removed the scales from their eyes or or I don't know if these are just people tired, non white people tired of the United States. But when I listen to them critique the United States, man, it's a whole lot different. And and I'm gonna play this clip because I asked somebody would you ever hear Joy Reid go on a rant like this against the United States? You know, not just going on a rant, but spitting facts as well. Um, would you hear a Mark Lamont Hill on the Black News Channel go off like this? You'll definitely never hear a Don Lemon talk about these geopolitics in the way of this Indian news presenter from, I think it's the um, We On channel, but it may be a different channel. But let me play this clip for uh, you and our audience. Hello and welcome. You're watching News Acts, a Nation at Nine with me, Megha Sharma. It's a jungle out there in Ukraine. Each and every one must fend for himself or herself. There is constant bombardment and shelling that is taking place in Kyiv, in Kharkiv, and in Sumy. The Russians have taken over most of the regions in the east. They are traveling over to the west, and these regions are where several Indian nationals are stuck. Also stuck amongst them are students from other nationalities, Bangladeshis, Nepalis, Africans, Middle Eastern, Turks, Pakistanis. They are all people of color. As the racist West segregates us, the discrimination is striking during the Ukrainian war. The horrific tales that the students have narrated say it all. Now these kids are being harassed, they are being beaten, they are held hostage, they are not being allowed to take buses and cabs to reach the borders. At this difficult time of need, India has yet again risen up to the occasion. The embassy and the Ministry of External Affairs are saving all of us. They are saving the Hindus, the Muslims, the Nepalese, the Turks, Pakistanis, Africans. There is no discrimination from our end. We never have discriminated. This blatantly exposes the West, the Europeans and their racist fascist mindsets. They have always had a superiority complex. They continue to look at us all with disdain, but the new world order uh, will not let this hypocrisy sustain for long. And we won't forget this. The racist people, the racist governments, the Europeans and the racist bureaucrats and their officials, the racist blue-eyed, blonde-haired journalists and the so-called civilized, evolved countries and their people who decide how to treat us on the basis of the color of our skin. Let's open up this discussion. I quickly go to my panelists. All right, I, I'm going to stop it there, but she goes on to play some clips of that most people should have been made aware of it, is of the European news, uh, so-called journalists. Um, I think presenter is a good, <laughs> a better word than journalist. Uh, right. But these news presenters and their blatantly racist comments about the Ukrainian refugees and and I mean, wow. But when I listened to this woman talk, I was like, wow. It, it was a number of things. I would never hear that on MSNBC coming out, those words coming out the mouth of Joy Reid, um, you know, uh, any any news presenter here in, in the United States. But also, most importantly, is this new world order that she's talking about, because I don't think she's talking about the same one George H.W. Bush was talking about in the 80s. Right, I mean, right. your, your thoughts on what you heard? Yeah, no, exactly. I know yeah, I said it. a lot. And no, 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 this bro. Ramble, but. I don't know, bro. You you know, we like we were separated first somehow. I don't know how, how it is. I'm two years older than you, but we were separated first, bro. I, I think the exact same thing, man, and that's something, you know, and I don't, uh, I listened to this this network. I can't remember the name of it. I think it's Gravitas or something like that. But I listened to this Indian network, and they're actually not that. They're a little bit more conservative than a lot of the other networks you'll see. But uh, the Chinese network that you can still get on, on uh, YouTube. There's uh, a couple of commentators from Europe. This guy who's uh, from he's in London. From he's British from in London, 
and there's an, I think he's a Canadian guy who's in Greece. They have a, a daily podcast. Uh, sometimes they work together, and they do reporting on the war, and they're talking about the exact same thing. And the thing that you understand, and that I think most of the world understands. I'm here in Costa Rica, and uh, I, I had a brief conversation with a guy today about this, right? There is a geopolitical shift happening in the world. It's tectonic. This is not a small thing, right? We, are, we have a shift in the geopolitical power base from west, uh, based in the United States, but also all of Europe, Western Europe, to the east, based in China, but also including this constellation uh, that includes uh, uh, Russia and India. And then you're going to see, I think, South Africa. And, and even though Brazil is kind of iffy because they've got a Trump-like president right now, that's not going to last for long because Lula, their, their ex-president, who I think was kind of moderate before, but I think when he's elected again, and I'm almost positive he will be, it's going to be, He's going to be, I think he's going to be the reincarnation of Hugo Chavez. So what I'm saying is that we've got an alignment, a, a, a realignment of the geopolitical power in the world, right? And it's shifting to uh, people that we know nothing about. We think Putin is a, is a villain. Well, I don't know, right? But I know this. He, is, he has won this fracas, this uh, confrontation with NATO and with the United States. He's won, right? Because... He's doing business. He's been preparing for this for at least since Libya fell. And so you're seeing more deals done in rubles, in Chinese yuan, right, which is devaluing the dollar. What does that mean? Well, you don't have to be an economist to understand that if we print the money that we pay our bills in, that is a heck of an advantage. Now, when these countries don't, don't accept that as payment, then that's a heck of a disadvantage because you've done nothing to earn we don't make anything of value, right? And so we right. can't easily get our hands on rubles, Chinese yuan, rupees in India. We can't get our hands on that because we don't sell anything to them. We don't make anything to, to sell to them. We just print that money, right? And so right. we and the only thing, ahead. You know, just to interject real quick, the only thing that gives the U.S. dollar any value is not because of anything the U.S. has done or has because, as you mentioned, don't manufacture nothing really, you know, um, uh, in terms of the global economy, but in persuading the Saudis for whatever reason to only right. accept, you know, right. uh, payments for its oil in the U.S. Right. dollar, which That's gave right. rise to what's known as the petrol dollar. That's and, right. And that was big news with, with MBS over there in Saudi Arabia. Um, who looks like he is, well, I've been in Saudi Arabia, and it is a repressive monarchy uh, regime that the United States has never had a, had a problem uh, aligning itself with, despite the party that whatever president is in office at the time. Uh, but he is considering accepting, you know, the one, as you mentioned, from China for its That's oil right. purchases. And what if... Venezuela follows swoops of uh, um, suit. What right. you know, uh, Russia, as you mentioned, um, India made a small purchase of oil in the rupee um, right. or the ruble, the Russian ruble, and right. and while that's a small amount, three million barrels, you know, right. they go through that in a day. But yeah. they did that in the face of a threat from the U.S. that if you buy anything from Russia and you don't sanction Russia, we're going to sanction you. And, right, it, right. and I'm listening to these different analysts they bringing on uh, on these Indian news channels, the Chinese, and what have you, and they don't seem to be phased at all by these sanctions because I feel like they know what's coming, that they have a contingency plan that the United States seems to be playing dumb about. Well, they, they've been, they, you know, I think led by Russia, but China also, right? And I don't think, I don't think China is perfect in any sense, but China at least is, you know, uh, the United States is imperialist and a colonizer. China is just trying to do sort of just good business, right, which is not necessarily in terms of Africa or even in terms of black people. It's not necessarily uh, advantageous to us, but at least it's not crippling the way imperialism has been. And so China and Russia, what I'm saying is that China and Russia, and I think other countries too, Venezuela, I think Argentina sees it, They've been preparing for because they see it as United States overreach. And we've been doing this particularly since Libya. Libya was the tipping point for a lot of the world who saw, oh, so they're just going to go in and take stuff, right? They realized 
what you have to understand about Libya, why Libya was so important, you have to context, contextualize it and what was happening at the time. We were going through a great recession, which was almost a great depression, right? And what triggered that was theft through the subprime mortgages, predatory mortgages, usurious interest rates. It was fraud. They defrauded the borrower who were disproportionately what? Black and brown, right? And they mm -hmm. also defrauded the investors who they bundled up these mortgages, these fraudulent mortgages, told these investors, many of whom were, most of whom were wealthy white people, and they told them, oh, no, this is very valuable. Go ahead, take this, you know, pay me this, and you can have this, right? And they later defrauded both the borrower and the investor, right? And the economy tanked. And so the United States just started printing money in, in lieu of those profits that people could know, you know, I, you know if I had a home, and, uh, meaning the bailouts, course. when you say just printing money, meaning the bailouts. Yeah, the bailouts, but also this, this quantitative easing where basically they're mm -hmm. buying these bad debts off the books of the banks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the lowering of the interest rates to almost zero, which means that the money is cheap. The banks have borrowed it basically to reinflate their balance sheets and also to invest in more speculative ventures, right? It's not going to grease to oil or to, or to uh, 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 jet up an industrial sector, right, a productive sector, it's just used on speculation. That's our economy. And so the reason Libya is important, and, you know, these things happen for a lot of reasons, but one, one very real reason that Libya happened, that we went and we crushed Libya, which, by the way, was the most prosperous country on the African continent, not the subcontinent, the continent, right? If you were a Libyan citizen, you got a free house, you got a monthly, I think, or regular dividends from the oil revenues, you got, you could get three PhDs and not, and not pay for a single book in Libya under Gaddafi, right? And Gaddafi, by the way, you know, we, we portray him as this crazy, eccentric, madman terrorist in the West, but in Africa and throughout the, 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 uh, uh, the developing world, he's known as probably the greatest uh, Pan-Africanist uh, alive at the time of his death, right? So we mm -hmm. went in there, and we went in there basically at the behest of Goldman Sachs to take everything Libya owned. We went for their gold reserves, which were plentiful. Uh, Gaddafi wanted to start an all-Africa uh, currency that was backed by gold, which mm -hmm. would have been a game changer. You hear Especially me? Especially for the would French, and, and, that's, and that's why the French played such a, a role in the uh, NATO bombardment of Libya because it would have displaced, you know, uh, their currency from some of those uh, um, countries that they colonized. That's, that's exactly right. The French, you know, you have to understand this. The French, the only reason they aren't as, as uh, 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 oppressive as the United States, they don't have as many guns. That's the only reason. The French are mm -hmm. horrible, just mm -hmm. horrible. The French government, not the people. The French government, horrible, right? And so, you know, we, we, the rest of the world is what I'm saying. The rest of the world understands what's going on. The United States is at the end of its leash. It doesn't have any good options to continue at the head of the world order. And they've been preparing, Russia in particular, pulling in the BRICS countries, Brazil, uh, right. uh, India, uh, China, South Africa, pulling them in. That's why you see at the United Nations now, when you see this, uh, these abstentions, in the vote to denounce Russia, you see right, uh, right. Brazil hasn't done it, but that's because they got this lunatic president. But but uh, China and India and South Africa, they won't go for it. They won't go there. They, they won't support the, the war. Yeah, can. the majority of the world's population, the governments that represent the majority of the world's population, did not vote. You know, uh, on these resolutions to condemn Russia. But again, you know, since we're commenting or talking about the lack of objective journalism, you know, uh, what's being portrayed as the quote-unquote international community coming against Putin is really just uh, the United States, Australia, and Europe. That's right. That's exactly right. The West, the, the West as we know it, right, which is what? White, the white settler colonial enterprise. That's basically what it is, right, the white settler colonial which is a which is a criminal enterprise, right? And, you know, this is another conversation, Scotty, and maybe we can't talk about this at some point. China is starting to come into the rest of the world. They're here in Costa Rica where I am. They're, they're all throughout Africa. And I don't think China's going to save Africa, right? I don't think it's going to, it's going to save the developing world. But they sure aren't a, a, a hurdle for these countries. In other words, they're doing honest business in there, which disadvantages or advantages capital, which is what China is, right? China's got a lot of money because they become 
the shop floor for the world. So they've got money, right? Africa mm -hmm. doesn't have that. So they're disadvantaged in these deals. But it's not destructive. They're not stealing it. They're not taking it. They're not dispossessing people. It's an honest commercial exchange, right? Which I'm not the biggest capitalist in the world. I don't think that's going to save you. But you can, you can find some wiggle room within that arrangement, right? right? They're not and the idea of commercial man. transaction. Yeah, they're not the idea. They're not, they're not going to, you know, they're not the savior, right? But it's, you can find some, you can find some breathing space within an honest commercial transaction if you're Africa, if you're the developing South. You can find some wiggle room, some space for, from which you can grow. You can't do that under colonialism, under white settler colonialism. They just take. They take and they kill. That's, that's all they do. So, uh, you know, the media at this point, man, it's really it's complicit in this kleptocracy that is uh, the mm -hmm. white settler colonial state. Um, last, the last um, thing, I want to talk about financial. Okay, because this, this guy, Mr. Khan, only invested $50 million, which I don't think is a whole lot in terms of the budgets of these other corporate uh, operations. And so I feel like, you know, that was a half-hearted uh, investment. In, in, and then, you know, you're shutting it down when it's still basically a startup. But some people have said that they would have been successful if they'd have been web-based only. You know, um, when they're trying to get on cable news, a lot of these people are moving their operations online or integrating, you know, the Internet as a bigger part of their distribution strategies and what have you. And so, so what is your analysis of that? Because to be honest with you, I, I didn't, I'm like you. I expected it to fail, you know. I expected it to fail because of the overhead of a traditional uh, newsroom. I, I I didn't know that he invested that kind of money. I agree, it's not uh, a, a lot of money for a a billionaire, and I expect a multi-billionaire. It's not that much money. But at the same time, Scotty, I I I, <laughs> I invite you to think about what you and I could do. With fifty billion, fifty million dollars, right? right? Like fifty million dollars would be a lot for us who are honest brokers, who have imagination, who can innovate. There's a lot we could do. We we could change the world for fifty million. So it you know it's not a lot, but it is a lot too, right? If you follow uh, a different formula, it, it's right, a lot right. of money. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I this is I don't know I don't know what this was, you know I don't know anything about this guy. Uh, is it Khan? You say I don't know anything yes. about him. I, I suspect no, the I, owner of the the owner of the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. Right. I I, I say this. I, what I do know about him is that he hired this clearly racist coach. Is it Urban Meyer to yes. coach his uh, football team? Clearly, the man is a racist, right? Uh, and he had to have known that. So I suspect that this black news channel, uh, you know, it, it seems absurd that fifty million dollars would not be. Uh, a lot of money, but for him it wasn't. I suspect he was just trying to buy some goodwill, but they couldn't even make it work on $50 million, and so he pulled the plug. But, uh, you know, the, the financials are wrong because the mission, the goal is wrong, right? You can right. build audience, but you have to, if you're going to build audience, right, it's just like the Hollywood, right? Hollywood doesn't take all this money to make a good movie. You can make a good movie for virtually nothing. I mean, look at the battle for Algiers. How much money did it take to to, to make the Battle of Algiers. I, I, don't, you know, I don't know what it was, but it's a pittance compared to what the movies that they're making now, which is just awful. God, awful, right? Mm -hmm. but, but the news means the same thing. It doesn't take that. It does. It takes some money, right? Reporting is expensive. You need people who can go out there, talk right. to people, interview people, and decide right. how do you make that into a story. And that takes some skill and some training, right? Mm -hmm. but, but that's the only way you can do it. It's the only one way. All this technology language and storytelling is still king. All this mm -hmm. technology, I don't care what you say, the, 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 the technology can help you promote good storytelling. But if you don't have mm -hmm. good storytelling, you're lost. I'm, I'm going to write about this very soon, Scotty, but this is, this is still the key to our emancipation, right? You know, what, what does, you know, the, the radical black tradition and the voice, let me tell you this quick story, Scotty. I know you have to go, but let me just tell you this quick story uh, as quick as I can. Um, the Scottsboro Boys, 1931 in Alabama, nine young black men aged thir between 13 and 19, I think, on a train looking for work in Alabama, and uh, they get into a little bit of a tussle with these white boys who are also on the train looking for work. 
uh, the brother, you know, basically knocks the crap out of these young white boys, throw them off the train while it's moving. Nobody's hurt or anything like that. Um, and the 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 boy somehow, the white boy somehow uh, gets the police involved. And so at the next stop, Scottsboro, Alabama, uh, the police stop this train, come and arrest all the boys, and they're talking to these two young women who are white women who are sex workers, right? But they don't want to get jammed up on a, on a prostitution charge, so they say uh, that, the, that the nine young men raped them. The, not the, the young men didn't even see the white girls on the train. They were in a different, different car. Uh, and so they're charged and convicted within a matter of a month by an all-white jury, right? Um, uh, the, the, the point that I'm making is that this story is famous in part because it marked a, re, a reversal of that jury and a repudiation of the racism at the heart of it, right? Uh, the communists got involved, the blacks, uh, the, the black working class, in particular, not the NAACP, which was not really all that enthused about uh, uh, representing these young men, right? But um, the, the, the black community, along with the communists, basically uh, mounted a defense uh, and, and by the time it was over, they got all nine men exonerated or, 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 and freed, right? But the point I'm making is this. Uh, there was a point early on when the communists had to make some kind of choice, right, about how they were going to mount, how they were going to raise money to defend these young men. And they were getting all these phone calls, and they were talking about, well, you know, we can have this official in the party go out, we can have this official party. And they said, no, no, no. We should have the people themselves go out. The mothers, the mothers of these young men, they should go out. And there was one in particular. Uh, she was, I think, in her, in her mid-30s at the time, Ada Wright, Mother Wright, they called her. And they sent this woman all around the world. And she would say, look, I don't, I don't know a communist from a, uh, from a car, right, you know, but I know that they're helping me and my sons uh, free themselves from this frame-up. This is a frame-up by the bosses. They want to divide blacks and whites. She was a sensation. She had a high school diploma, if that, right? She had no uh, 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 previous experience as a public speaker. She was a maid, a domestic, right? She was a sensation all around the world. People were handing their babies to her. Fr Franklin Roosevelt would get would get a uh, a uh, 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 Frequent updates. Where is she? What is she doing? What did she say? Right? It galvanized people. It sparked their imagination. That's what's missing from our media today. That is what's missing. The, the, mm -hmm. the radical black voice and the radical black voice telling the story of the most oppressed people, black people in the United States. Or, or if you want to say black people and Native Americans, I think we should always talk about what's happening to Native Americans too. But still, that's what's missing from our conversation, and that's why the Black News Channel failed. That's why the media is failing spectacularly right now, spectacularly, mm. right? It's an institution that is in decline as much as any institution in America, I believe, right? More than labor unions, more than political parties. The media has failed in a way that is epic. So obviously you see uh, opportunity um, there. And um, at a different time, perhaps, you know, we can have you back on and we can uh, get more into, you know, the alternatives. Because if you're going to tell somebody, and I'm saying I'm the one that's telling them, I've telling people for years that you need to break out of those corporate news bubbles. I know, I know, <laughs> and I said this before, I know Joy Reid can seem so sassy sometimes. And right. and then right. then you got Rachel with her quirky self and her sexual, yeah. image, you know, jokes right. about Putin's penis and, and all that. But come oh on. Oh, my people. God. Does she really do that? Does she yeah, oh she made God. a Putin penis joke about oh, about Jesus. his penis, and I'm paraphrasing what she said, but that's the reason why he invaded Ukraine because he got a small penis. Oh, <laughs> that's right. what's passing itself off as news an analysis or geopolitical analysis. So perhaps we could have you back, man, and talk about some of the prescriptions to solving. Uh, this problem for giving black people uh, uh, credible sources of uh, information. Um, anytime, bro. Anytime. Before you go, can you tell people how they can connect with you online and, and consume some of your uh, journalistic endeavors? 
I, I am on uh, Patreon, uh, Patreon backslash John Jeter. I have a website, johnjeter.com, and most importantly, I have a book that I, I believe will be published this summer. Uh, we're hammering out the details now. Uh, Class War in America, you can see, you can check in on classwarinamerica.com uh, to see when it will be released, but I expect it to be sometime midsummer. All right, John, will you take your, care of yourself in that part of the world, and we definitely look forward to having you back sometime soon. Anytime, brother. I loved it.